Merci. Je vais revenir euh, effectivement sur... Euh... Thank you very much. Yes, I will come back to the two important discussions we had today, the um, EU victims' rights strategy. And, of course, there is a link between the victims' rights strategy and the discussion at commission level this morning and racism and xenophobia, because a lot of victims are victims of um, racist and xenophobic crimes. And this is the first time that anything of this scale has been put in place at EU level concerning victims' rights to, on the one hand, carry out European actions via the Commission, but also to carry out actions with member states and civil society in each of these member states. And that's important to work in this way at several levels. This strategy also addresses all victims, no matter where the crime was com committed and no matter under what circumstances those crimes were committed. And I think that that's important to note because a few years ago we did indeed focus on victims of terrorist acts. Um, following several Europe, terrorist attacks in Europe and the world. But now we want to address all victims, no matter what the crime and no matter where the crime occurred in Europe. And in order to go about things in this way, the two big axes of, these, of this strategy is to strengthen uh, and the enforcement of victims' rights, but also to ensure that all actors are working together to promote those rights. And the aims of the strategy are fairly comprehensive. They focus on addressing problems encountered by victims when it comes to um, making their rights heard. One important point is effective communication with victims and to provide safe environments for, for them to talk about their situation and to um, file a complaint. During the COVID-19 crisis, we've uh, seen situations arise linked to domestic violence, for instance, how to provide a safe environment for victims, for them to um, complain file a complaint about their situation without incurring increased risks. So communication is important and making it possible for victims to have a safe place in which to um, lodge a complaint and explain their situation. We also want to support and protect the most vulnerable victims. When I say vulnerable victims, I mean I just mentioned victims of domestic violence, but also children who may have been abused. This is uh, something that has come up time and again throughout the crisis in our contact with justice ministers across the EU. How can we put in place specific protection mechanisms for those vulnerable victims, but also for victims of hate crimes, racism or xenophobic crimes? That was the discussion in the college this morning as well. And, of course, we need to place specific focus on the LGBTI plus community, but also victims of terrorist crime who were unfortunate enough to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and who have to enjoy a specific focus. The third point is facilitating victims' access to compensation and to ensure that everywhere in the EU victims can be compensated appropriately and swiftly, no matter, again, what the crime in question is. A fourth element is strengthening cooperation and coordination among all actors. So anyone who plays a role in defending victims' rights and promoting victims' rights has to work together with the other actors. This may take the form of a platform at European level of all the relevant actors. And then, fifthly, strengthening the international dimension. Of course, there are victims of crime on European soil who may come from other um, countries, and there is cooperation with the OECD and the UN on this. Now, among the actions that we intend to carry out next year, there will be an action to um, provide uh, information on victims' rights. We also wish to focus on training. I think it's important for everybody to understand how we want to facilitate access to justice, access to um, mechanisms for, to file complaints, and the Commission has to um, support various projects among civil society. In budgetary terms, the Commission paid specific attention in its 2021 budget proposal 
to ensure that um, fundamental rights and values are particularly strengthened. And this will enable us to um, fund these sorts of victim support projects. And we will, of course, also ensure that all support elements for victims of crime across the EU will be properly implemented, as I already mentioned, working with civil society to uh, implement projects across the EU and um, above support and um, help, we may also need other measures in order to ensure that this is implemented correctly across the EU. Another point I would like to make, I mean, many things have already been said on the uh, data protection um, regulation. We've, it's now been in place for two years, GDPR, and I think we can really state that it has had a positive effect. There were some companies who may have been hesitant at the beginning, who were afraid of um, distorted competition due to uh, new burdens, but, uh, I, but many companies now view this as positive. Citizens have been well informed of the GDPR and on how to better protect their personal data. At international level, we have also worked with partner countries in order to ensure that data protection in Europe also leads to data protection in third countries when it comes to data exchange. Now, that can facilitate access to the single market, but also the ease of data exchange between European and non-European actors. All of this um, goes along with a certain degree of flexibility in the GDPR, and we recently saw an example of this flexibility during the COVID-19 crisis when discussions were taking place surrounding tracing apps, how to ensure protection of personal data in the context of such tracing apps linked to uh, public and individual health. Now, all of these aspects are positive and show some of the positive um, elements of the last two years. And now let me look to the future and what we can expect in the coming years to further strengthen the GDPR. Now, first, we have to ensure that it is applied harmoniously or at least with the same vigor across the European territory. There may be some nuanced differences, but it has to be applied with the same vigor across the whole EU territory. And in order for that to happen, data protection authorities have to be sufficiently equipped. They have to have the relevant number of staff, uh, the relevant budgets, and there is a clear will to move in that direction. We also I have to convince those who may still be reticent towards the GDPR. Certain companies, for instance, who have complained about how difficult it is to implement it, I think we need to explain to them what the um, requirements of the GDPR are and how they can implement these. When it comes to citizens, of course, many citizens, as we have seen from surveys, are aware of the existence of the GDPR. Uh, we believe that more than two-thirds of Europeans above the age of 16 are aware of the existence of the GDPR. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the application of the GDPR is simple. Some of them, some citizens still run into difficulties. When you are looking for something on the Internet, you have to accept all sorts of things, cookies, etc., and everyone, including commissioners, have a tendency to just click yes to move through to the page you want to view. So how can citizens citizens make best use of their rights to data protection, perhaps in new applications as well, to ensure that data is protected across all operators. So the GDPR um, provides the support to innovation in this respect, and there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in order to strengthen innovation. So these are elements that we will be working on, strengthening the implementation across Europe, ensuring that DPAs can carry out their responsibilities uh, to the, in the best way possible, but also to supporting companies and European citizens. Now, when working in this way, we will certainly also be working with um, guidelines that will come in to support the GDPR provided by the Commission. Um, as well as the Council and uh, National Data Protection Authorities. Because in various new areas, we will have to be able to provide guidance quickly 
just as we did on the tracing apps recently, we were able to say quite quickly bef what the rules under the GDPR are that may be applicable before these tracing apps are implemented. And finally, we will, of course, continue working very hard to ensure that our exchanges with third countries include um, data protection um, rules. I work very closely with Phil Hogan on this um, because when it comes to trade, international trade, for instance, this is an element that comes into play. So with a whole host of uh, partners, we will see our discussions evolving. I would like to conclude by saying that the GDPR really is showing the way forward. We now see that in various countries and regions across the globe, there is a stronger will from Brazil to South Korea and Japan to protect personal data. And when it comes to data transfer with a um, member that is leaving us, uh, the United Kingdom, we want to make sure that in any Brexit agreement there is the proper application of the rules of the GDPR both on the European continent and in the United Kingdom. So these are the um, aspects that we discussed today, and I'm sure a lot more work will be undertaken to find the right balance between protecting personal data and providing access to information by authorities, the police, for instance, or courts when it comes to investigating crime, for instance. I started off my intervention talking about protecting victims' rights, and so there is a delicate balance to be struck there that we will continue to work towards. So I think at the end of the day, we can be pleased with a um, high-performing tool that we now have in the GDPR. It is working well, but we have to continue working on it and promoting it internationally.